Okay. Hello, good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, Aparna ji. How are you? Good morning, uh, Subhash ji. Thank you so much for joining us. We have uh, with us the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, Mrs. Alpana Dubey, with us. Uh, and, uh, the as well, and uh, you know, Mr. Dr. Adrish and Mr. Shivek, whom, with whom you spoke last week for a couple of yes. minutes. Yes. Yes. And we have Mr. Nagraj Prasad, who's helping us set up this whole thing. So. Namaskar. 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 Namaskar to everybody. Namaskar. I'm glad that we just made it. Two minutes. Uh, <laughs> two minutes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so I think uh, Nagaji, we can uh, if you could help us get. Yes. So we have we are live on Facebook as we speak, and right. we have people joining in on Facebook. Uh, so I will be transferring this mode to speaker mode. So uh, Apanaji, you can go ahead and start the program. We are on live. Namaskar, Swadikha. Good evening. My name is Aparna Patwardhan. I am the director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, Bangkok. Today we are hosting a talk and panel discussion on artificial intelligence and India's scientific traditions. Our guest speaker is an eminent scientist, Padma Shri, Dr. Subhash Kark. The talk will be followed by a panel discussion with Dr. Subhash Kark and two distinguished professionals from Thailand on the panel. I welcome Dr. Subhash Kark, Dr. Adrish Brahmadat, and Mr. Sa uh, uh, Shivek Sachdeva. Before we start, I request Mrs. Alpana Dubey, our Deputy Chief of Mission, who is present at this session, to make opening remarks. Madam Alpana Dubey. Thank you, Aparna. Good evening. Uh, good morning to uh, Professor uh, uh, Sri Siddharth, Dr. Subhas Takji, and uh, uh, Professor, no, Dr. Adrish Brahma Dutta and uh, Mr. Shivek Sachdeva, the distinguished speaker and the panelist of the today's talk. I thank Aparna and SVCC Bangkok for organizing this very special talk and panel discussion on a very pertinent topic that is artificial intelligence and India. And we have so renowned and distinguished speaker today from India and also speakers representing Thailand. Uh, of course, they are also from India or Indian origin, but we see the relevance of these new and emerging technology today, which is like very uh, important for the development of any country, including India and Thailand. Uh, so uh, I know that Aparna has introduced that uh, Dr. Subhas Kak is a distinguished uh, person present here who is also uh, in the I think he is in the uh, Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovations Advisory Council and also been conferred the Civilian Award Padma Sri. So it will be an honor and privilege to hear you, sir. And uh, the other people who are also practitioner of uh, like in the technology field as well as the Indian uh, science, our uh, which is like in the Veda and uh, what India has the heritage uh, of those, uh, uh, that is uh, the knowledge that India always had. So it would be an honor to hear all of you. And we know that the government of India has also given a lot of emphasis on artificial intelligence in recent years, and Niti Aayog has been identified as the nodal agency to monitor the development of artificial intelligence and how it could be used for the other technology development and delivery of services. Similarly, uh, in Thailand also, we see there is a lot of emphasis in the Thailand 4.0. Uh, so there is like artificial intelligence and robotics has been given importance for the industrial development. So I will not say much. We just look forward to hear both all the distinguished speaker and the panelists. And, uh, uh, I will just hand over to Aparna. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Can machines develop consciousness? This is a frequently asked question in science and technology circles these days. One can see discussions on consciousness entering the artificial intelligence space. Consciousness has been a philosophical subject, but space, time, matter, and consciousness have been the principles on which science was developed in ancient India. Indian science and philosophy have gone hand in hand. Perhaps Indian science, ideas from the Indian civilization, 
and the history or chronology of Indian science can answer many questions that mod modern science asks today. Today we have with us Dr. Subhash Kak, who will, who while being a scientist of the modern era, has done profound research on the foundations of Indian science. We have therefore invited him to speak on the topic of artificial intelligence and India's, India's scientific traditions. Although he is too eminent to be introduced as a formality, I will do so. Dr. Subhash Kark is Regents Professor of Computer Science Department at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, USA. Born in Srinagar, Kashmir, he completed his PhD in Electrical Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. He's been a visiting faculty at Imperial College London and a guest researcher at Bell Laboratories, Murray Hill. He was with Louisiana State University as a distinguished professor of electrical and computer engineering. His research is on cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, archaeoastronomy, and history of science. He proposed a fast matrix multiplication algorithm and a new way of representation of numbers using unary coding. In cryptography, he is the inventor of the only true quantum cryptography protocol and he ad and advanced new me methods of secret sharing that are of importance in distributed systems such as wireless and sensor networks. He is a member of India, Indian Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council since 2018 and he was awarded the Indian Civilian Award Padma Shri in 2019. The Pantheon project of MIT has him in, his, uh, in its list of 33 computer scientists. His other awards include British Council Fellow, Science Academy Medal of the Indian National Science, of, uh, Science Academy, UNDP, UNDP Topton Award, National Fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, and Distinguished Alumnus of IIT New Delhi. He has served on academic advisory committees of the Smithsonian and NIST and on the advisory boards of several technology companies. He has served as editor of many tech publications, has many patents registered in his name, has been on many shows speaking on topics ranging from philosophy to history to science and technology. He has authored several articles and books on various topics. Some of his books include The Circle of Memory, which is an autobiography, Matter and Mind, India at Centuries, and Computing Science in Ancient India, The Wishing Tree, Presence and Promise of India, the architecture of knowledge, quantum mechanics, neuroscience, computers, and consciousness. Dr. Kark is not just a scientist, but also a poet and historian. It is indeed a great honor to have you as a speaker at our event, Dr. Kark. I now requ request you to present your talk. Speak of these two in the same breath, because artificial intelligence is a post-computer age uh, field uh, where uh, we try to um, computerize or put in terms of uh, algorithms different uh, cognitive operations that human minds do. That's what AI does, because human minds also process information in an orderly fashion. And when we copy that uh, in a computer, that's when we get AI. So the question um, a skeptic would have is that, how can we connect it to India's ancient science? Because uh, all this is very, very recent. Well, it so turns out, and uh, uh, it's uh, recognized by scholars uh, everywhere, that India's uh, scientific tradition not only had uh, the usual subjects of uh, uh, mathematics and astronomy and uh, medical science uh, such as uh, Ayurveda, but uh, one of the greatest uh, points of focus of Indian tradition was the human mind, was the analysis of how the mind works. And that's what, in fact, led to the development of uh, traditions such as yoga, because uh, yoga is uh, uh, asanas, and as we all know, yoga has conquered the entire world, no matter where you go, small town in any remote part of the world, you will come across yoga studios. And um, although in the beginning, many people are attracted to it because of health style, because of uh, advantages, uh, to wellness and so on, but everybody knows that that's only the beginning. 
and it opens uh, the way to a person not only looking into his own body but also into the mind because you know as you all know by the body and mind form a complex and and there is a lot in uh, in yoga and the yogic uh, tradition or the indian cognitive tradition which is still of relevance to modern science and um, it's of relevance also to um, physical sciences because in physical science as well uh, the question of where the observer is in relation to the observed system is a, is a puzzle that physics has been dealing with in fact going all the way back to albert einstein then it's also a major issue in computer science because the question is why is it that the brain machine is conscious while the silicon machine of the computer is not conscious so that is another reason why we want to do it the third is that uh, um, what are the tasks uh, that can be computerized for example there's been a lot of uh, emphasis in the past 10 years on self-driving cars now can the technology of self-driving cars go beyond where it is now and we know that should that happen it will have a huge disruptive impact on economies all over the world in the us itself it has been estimated that about uh, 30 to 40 percent of all the employment is in the transportation sector if uh, all these cars and uh, trucks were to become self-driving clearly there would be huge huge issues which would ripple through the entire economy and society and polity itself now um, um, the listeners in thailand would be uh, interested in um, hearing that in a recent lecture dalai lama said uh, western psychology is kg kindergarten compared to indian psychology and by indian psychology he meant yoga and he also meant the whole complex of yoga and ayurveda and so indeed there are enough grounds uh, scholarly and grounds understood by the general public that uh, confirm to us that the indian um, cognitive science tradition the indian yoga and psychology tradition and this also includes disciplines such as tantra uh, has insights which if uh, computer scientists and other scientists were to invest time and energy into understanding who might uh, in most likelihood provide us uh, further clues as to where technology should go uh, because right now as we know um, all, all over the world there's a lot of disquiet that if AI and pervasive automation proceeds the way it's going, we might be entering a phase in uh, world political and society development, which we may not have all the tools to deal with, because uh, with pervasive uh, uh, automation and uh, additional use of AI, clearly more and more jobs, and I already just mentioned the transportation sector, but forget the transportation sector, a lot of other stuff that human beings do in their offices uh, is uh, cognitive tasks, which can be automated. Not all, certainly not creative tasks, uh, we uh, believe, but uh, the non-creative tasks can be automated, and therefore we should all pay attention to it. And uh, certainly India and Thailand both, because um, both uh, Thailand and India share uh, a, a lot of focus on the inner sciences and therefore if uh, professors and students and scientists in both these countries and in other countries were to uh, devote uh, more attention to this problem and try to bring together both the ancient uh, and traditional knowledge uh, that we have in our traditions in the cognitive sciences and marry it, so to speak, to modern science and technology, to computer science, uh, something good would come out of it and uh, both uh, India and Thailand would be able to be world leaders uh, in this field.
And this is, of course, the field which is uh, the driver of a lot of technology. Uh, that's where a lot of value added um, uh, component of all technology is. It is in the computational field, and that's where the most important uh, component is, of course, AI, which is at the highest level. I must also uh, tell you something about um, a personal uh, involvement in a debate on AI that's been going on in the highest, uh, highest sectors of uh, science and technology planning in the West. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, the, the science establishment at the highest level in America set up a committee of 20 odd people, uh, and it consisted of computer scientists, uh, philosophers, uh, physicists, uh, and policy planners to uh, find an answer to the question as to whether computers of the future will become conscious. Now, I was also a member of it, and we had many, many week-long uh, uh, meetings. And one of those meetings uh, took place in London, in Cambridge. And, and um, in, in that meeting, there was a poll, informal poll taken of all the participants. So the question was, will computers of the future, if not in five years, maybe in 100 years, will become conscious? And I can tell you that 50% of the participants, and these are some of the world's leading um, scientists uh, in all these fields, 50% of the people said yes, that uh, in the future, computers will become conscious. And the other 50% said no. I myself was in the 50% which said that they will not become conscious. Um, now, uh, w what would be very uh, interesting to all of you listeners is that uh, these are all Americans and European scientists. And there was me, who's an Indian, and the 50% who said that computers will become conscious, they, when we asked them, why do you say so? They said, we are really inspired by a Buddhist idea of shunyata that underlying this physical and you know, perceived reality is nothingness. And the other 50% uh, were inspired by Vedanta. So it's very, very interesting that all of these people sitting in this room in Cambridge, UK, who were Americans and Europeans and one Indian were divided sort of equally between the Buddhist idea of Shunyata and the Vedantic idea of, um, of, of, uh, uh, of Advaita, of consciousness being the fundamental stuff. And therefore, and th these are the two positions which are, of course, a part of the cultures of Thailand and India. Uh, because in India, most uh, people do in, uh, subscribe to the idea of, uh, uh, of uh, mind or chetana being the fundamental ground stuff of reality. And a lot of Buddhists, not all, believe that, uh, uh, that shunyata is the foundation of reality. Now, I must also tell you as a scholar of Indian uh, tradition that in Mahapari Nirvana Sutra, uh, where the Buddha is uh, uh, laying down and he's going to uh, pass away the next day, uh, a lot of uh, uh, his followers come to him and they say, they start crying, they say, who is going to take care of us when you die? And then the Buddha gives them a sermon, and it's one of the great documents of Buddhism, and where he says, well, I told you uh, that, there is, uh, that there is no Atman. In fact, he had never answered this question when he used to be asked, is there Atman or not? Because Atman or Atma is uh, one of the foundational ideas in uh, Vedanta, and he would not answer it. But then uh, on his deathbed, he says, well, even though I, people who have followed me have believed, believed in the Anatta, in Pali Anatta, or Anatman doctrine, now I shall, you, I shall tell you the truth. I asked you, I, I told you about Anatma, or I didn't answer it, because you were too devoted to your practices. You had forgotten your connection with the fundamental questions of life, 
But now let me tell you that in reality, when a person dies, there is something which does persist. And uh, people have called it buddhakaya or this or that. In other words, on his deathbed, he did acknowledge the central, the foundational doctrine of the Vedas that there is uh, this Atma. And therefore, um, a lot of uh, the leading Buddhist scholars um, who are very popular in the West as well, do concede, they may not use the word Atma, they do concede the fact that there is uh, something called consciousness because this Atma is what is consciousness. And this consciousness is does not emerge out of the brain, it does not emerge of, out of matter and mind. And that's why it is fundamental and it is central. And this is something which has already transformed all of science. The, all that we have, all the wonders of modern science, such as uh, computers, such as nanotechnology, uh, even our understanding of chemistry and biology is based on a science called quantum mechanics, which was created in the 1920s. And the creator of uh, quantum mechanics was an Austrian physicist named Erwin Schrodinger. Now, Erwin Schrodinger himself was a Vedantin. And in fact, he used to carry a copy of the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita wherever he went. In his autobiography, he says that the central idea of quantum mechanics came to him from the Upanishadic Mahavakya, I am Atma Brahma, that this Atman is Brahman. And this was the idea which uh, went into his conception of the physical state as being a superposition of all possibilities. This is the central idea of quantum mechanics. I'm teaching you quantum mechanics in one line. In one that uh, there is superposition of all possibilities, which Schrodinger claimed came to him from uh, Vedanta. So uh, Indian science has is the foundation in so many different ways of modern science, not just quantum mechanics, because without quantum mechanics, you cannot have chemistry. Without chemistry, you cannot understand biology. Without biology, you cannot understand brain science. So this is the whole structure which rests on quantum mechanics. The other foundation of modern science is uh, mathematical logic, because as you know, a computer consists of logic gates which are connected and which are very, very minute because they are Im uh, imprinted on the substrate uh, using nanotechnology. Now, this, the theory of mathematical logic arose in England in the 1850s, and there were three Englishmen associated with it, and their, their names are Augustus de Morgan, George Boole, and Charles Babbage. Now, George Boole's wife, after her husband died, uh, wrote a famous essay in 1898 where he, she said that, look, these three friends were the disciples of George Everest, who was her uncle. And George Everest was the Surveyor General of India. And he lived in India for many, many years. And during the summers, he would come back to England from time to time. And according to Mary Boole, she says that what uh, these three inventors of mathematical logic did was only to give a new form to what George Everest taught them, which George Everest had learned in England. And this is what is called uh, Navya Nyaya. Navya Nyaya was a discipline of mathematical logic, of logic, which arose in Bengal and Bihar about 1000 years ago. And, uh, and these three gave a mathematical form to it, and that has come to form the foundation of, uh, um, of computer science as we know it. And therefore, uh, all of this, both from the perspective of uh, consciousness itself, which is uh, quantum mechanics and um, how it relates to everything else, and from the perspective of uh, the mathematics of uh, um, computer science itself, uh, India has contributed to world science and uh, 
and 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 there are there's no reason to doubt that all of these ideas and other ideas which are a part of the Indian tradition would also influence uh, or would have something to say to AI as it is uh, uh, evolving and emerging at this uh, particular time. Just to complete my story about uh, uh, the birth of mathematical logic, I should tell you that uh, Mount Everest is named after George Everest. In fact, uh, he lived in, um, in uh, Missouri, India for a long, long time. And, uh, and uh, as the Surveyor General of India, he put into place all that led to the discovery of this highest peak on Earth. So uh, with this, let me stop because I'm also eagerly uh, waiting for uh, the discussion with the other uh, two uh, guests. And so let me hand it uh, back to uh, Aparna ji. So I will uh, bring in the other two guests and uh, probably um, introduce them later because uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction about them. I don't want to uh, uh, stop this discussion when it's uh, going to such an interesting direction. Um, Dr. Adrish Pramadatta is the first uh, panelist. He's a qualified registered Ayurveda doctor, yoga teacher, Indian healing practitioner, a meditation teacher, and a wellness practitioner. And uh, Mr. Shivik uh, Sajdeva, he has expertise in digital tourism. He is managing director OMG Experience, GSA for Bhutan Airlines, and he's co-founder of Mindstree. He has special interest in artificial intelligence which serves his business needs. I invite both of them uh, to the discussion. Uh, Mr. Shivik, would you like to uh, begin? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. So, I mean, you know, I've been looking around the Facebook comments as well uh, for those people who are attending and they seem to have a lot of interesting questions. Uh, so, you know, what I did was I, I picked up a few and I will just table these questions to Professor Gak. So let's let's talk a bit more about AI. You know, this is a good chance for us, you know, and along with everyone else to ask a few questions to Professor. So let's let's start talking about AI. Um, so there's two things uh, which can differentiate in, in terms of AI. One is where humans' ability in giving the data and, and you know allowing the AI, the actual AI, to feed the data from, from the human. So this way, you are saying that you know the AI model is probably as good as it gets in terms of the human's ability to to train it. Um, it emerges another subdomain of AI, you know, which Professor has has mentioned earlier, being used for self-driving cars. Um, it's also famously being in the news for AlphaGo. Um, AlphaGo was the AI which actually beat uh, the human champions uh, in Go. Right, so this is another school or another subdomain of AI called reinforcement learning. So in this in this way, right, what human does is that human does not feed all the information uh, and provide AI with all the instruction. Human merely feeds the instruction uh, and rewards and punishes the AI. So let's say we are training this AI to you know um, play a game of tennis. Right, so every time the, the AI scores a point, the human would then reward the AI. And if they lose a point, then the human would punish the AI. So this way, human is somewhere giving the ability and the freedom um, to AI. So this is something which, you know, it, it will lead to a, a result of AI actually beating human. And this is one of the reasons why um, AI actually beat the human in the game of Go. My, my question, you know, to, to Professor is that, um, are we in a way losing control of AI, even though we are the one who, who actually initialized it? And if the AI were to become um, dangerous or become a maverick, um, are we therefore responsible for this? Oh, excellent question. Um, as uh, Shivek ji uh, said, uh, there are uh, different aspects because you can also, using reinforcement learning, uh, modify or set into the process um, a, 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 an evolution of the algorithm so that it gets better and better at that particular task. So there is, well, you can um, look at your question in two different ways. One is you can look at it at 
um, incremental advances in specific technologies. And that will continue to happen, although uh, there are also limitations. For example, you have deep learning right now, which uh, does exceedingly well, but then uh, these deep learning um, uh, neural networks can also be totally fooled by some kind of random patterns, and they misclassify them. So there are, uh, there are both these aspects. But um, to come back to the heart of your question, uh, in a certain sense, uh, we already have lost control to AI. And what do I mean by that? Um, AI is not only uh, the algorithms that uh, specific machines perform uh, for specific tasks. Perhaps you can also say, by taking a broader view of it, that AI is also the whole bureaucratic administrative system that we have in the world. See, for example, look at the recent COVID pandemic across the world. How various countries are responding to it can be viewed in so many different ways. For example, you look at Sweden or Taiwan or Japan, they have dealt with it in one way, while many other countries have dealt with it in a totally different way. And uh, scientists don't necessarily agree with each other, scientists from uh, these two sets of countries. And therefore, there is always this danger that as the challenges to economy and technology become more severe, and they are going to become more severe that because AI and different embodiments of technology will um, enter into more and more apps, right? Uh, not just self-driving cars, there could be other decision-making computers which take the place of uh, uh, humans. There could be more and more of automation of teaching itself. You don't need so many professors. All this can be centralized using Blue Gene app or other apps. And therefore, um, how is the world going to deal with it? Because we feel more comfortable ceding control to machines. We are already doing it. Uh, and possibly the claim could also be made uh, that it's not been very different in the past because you could say that uh, some charismatic people came along in this world and then they said, this is what the world is like. And they introduced their, let's call them religions or whatever else. And then people have followed them forever and ever, even though what was being said was not necessarily consistent with what science was. Because after all, we know that in the Middle Ages, a lot of scientists were even burnt at the stake just because they said certain things which were counter to what uh, was being proclaimed. So perhaps things similar to this will happen in the future decades as well, because human beings will cede control to uh, machines, also in the area of health, because we tend to believe doctors more and more, even though there is a uh, reproducibility crisis in medicine, more and more of what is published cannot be uh, reproduced by subsequent research. But in spite of that, when our doctors say, hey, take such and such pills, or you must take 20, 30 different pills every morning, as a lot of let's say Americans do, people do it because they, most people are not in a position to evaluate these choices for themselves. Back to you, Shivek or Aparna. <laughs> Dr. Adrish, would you like to uh, speak? Okay. Namaste, Professor Kak. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Nice to hear you. And I have a question for uh, what I understood that you uh, described earlier that in the in the, in the UK that 50% scientists agree with that uh, the machine is the future and some 50% uh, disagree with that. Uh, 
I have a question. Like in Sankhya Darsana, in uh, yogic science, uh, we say Purusa and Prakriti. Purusa is conscious, where Prakriti is the mixture of the material world, Tattva, Raja and Tama. So, do you think that uh, in somehow the uh, human that uh, in, in terms of AI can make these two together in such a way so that uh, they will appear as fully conscious? Adrishi, a uh, very, very good point. Uh, in Sankhya Darshan, we believe uh, Purush and Prakriti are apart. Um, yeah. And even in Vedanta, you have Atma sitting at the very top. You have the the koshas, yeah, but the Atman is beyond the koshas. Uh, in Western science, which is mainstream science, it's believed that con that Purush emerges out of Prakriti, that consciousness emerges out of the complexity of the connections in the brain, that just as Chemistry emerges out of physics or biology, you know, you have biology, living cells, but you also have chemistry in organic material and organic material. There is a distinction, right? And from a uh, combination of these organic material, you have molecules such as the DNA and out of which emerges uh, living cells and so on. You know, you have, um, you have copying of DNA and so on, and there is reproducibility or reproduction and all that. But Western science does not believe in this divide between Purush and Prakriti. In fact, this is the very heart of the discussion that's going on. Now, I must also clarify that this uh, uh, poll in Cambridge was not a general poll of all the scientists in England. It was just this committee of about 20 to 30 people, us, the committee which had flown in from America and there were four or five people from Europe. So it was these experts where those of the scientists and engineers who truly accept that eventually that the whole universe is computer like, right? And as the computers become more and more powerful, at some point they would be able to mimic all, everything that happens in the brain. And at that particular point, suddenly the computer will become conscious. While those of the modern scientists who believe that computers do not capture one aspect of science, which is quantum mechanics, because computers do everything in a classical, in a machine-like way, while quantum mechanics cannot be done in a machine-like way. Quantum mechanics, that's why, has all kinds of paradoxes, because quantum mechanics has this divide between the observer and the observed. And that's the reason why, as I told you in the uh, in the beginning, that Erwin Schrodinger was trying to embody the very heart of Vedanta. And Vedanta does have this division between uh, the material world and the Atman, right? And so it is consistent. You know, the various darshanas, whether you're looking at Sankhya or Yoga or Vedanta or Mimamsa or Nyaya, they are different perspectives on reality. They are complementing, they are not contrary, they are not opposite to each other. They are complementing each other. And so uh, the answer to your question is that many scientists and engineers and policy planners, including politicians at the highest level, believe that there is no reality accepting the material reality. And that's why they are driving decision making in a particular direction. But there are some others who believe in this Purush and Prakriti being apart. And this is a more difficult concept. This is a more subtle concept. And since uh, you're also a doctor, and this is a concept which is also at the very heart of, um, uh, of this crisis that medicine is facing, right? Because right. Uh, of the fact that modern medicine, uh, allopathy is not able to deal with chronic illnesses. And in fact, it sort of doesn't work at all. And, uh, and there is 70, 80, 90% of all the medical research cannot be reproduced because modern medicine leaves out the mind. Now, even though the mind in the yogic system is an instrument, is, it's the antahkaran, but it has the light of the Atman shining on it. And if you can take mind and body together, which is what Ayurveda does, that would be the next 
revolutionary change in well-being and medicine. Because right now, of course, Ayurveda is getting very popular all across the world, but it's not become mainstream uh, uh, at this point in the West. And in India also, uh, it still has to win an equal standing. You know, it's not, you have separate Ayurvedic hospitals. In fact, Ayurveda should be the, the, the doorway into health because it does take both the body and the mind together. And then if you have an illness which requires immediate uh, uh, response to symptoms, then certainly allopathy could be the right thing. You know, you have a, you have um, you have high fever and something needs to be done right away. It, the Western medicine is very good and uh, it's also very good where surgery, etc., has to be done. Now, of course, surgery was also a part of Ayurveda, but right now that's not been emphasized. So, personally, uh, my uh, my message to the scientific and decision-making community in India and in Thailand and elsewhere would be that truly in order to take the next, next step in health and medicine, we should have a system where people go through the door of Ayurveda and some people could be steered to allopathic medicine, but a lot of people who have chronic illnesses, a lot of older people need uh, uh, a treatment where body and mind and everything else are taken together. Thank you. It is wonderful. Thank you, sir. Good to let me also like let me also let me also add to what I've said. Uh, recent research has shown that uh, you know there's always a certain epistemology or logic behind every science. Mm -hmm. The logic behind allopathy <clears throat> is that there is illness or no illness. So it is a binary logic, right? Two-way logic. Right. But re recent uh, mathematical research uh, in logic itself has shown that two-way logic is inferior to three-way logic. And so uh, we know that Ayurveda is based on three-way logic. There is There are three doshas, right? There are three right. gunas in Sankhya itself. So what Ayurvedic doctors need to do is to go around and tell people that look it's not that we are we have three because three is some random number and you can certainly question why three because three is optimal this is the way medicine should be done and i think if they approach uh, other people who don't know about ayurveda in this way they would be able <clears throat> to convince them much more effectively thank you yeah, uh, it sounds really good if we even uh, combine both the ancient Indian sciences together, yoga and Ayurveda. And I do practice in that way. I take uh, for chronic, uh, especially my chronic uh, patients, I go with Ayurveda, which is holistic in nature indeed, and yogic practice together. And I try to heal because we know in yogic science, whatever in us, it is the representation of the entire cosmos, whatever within. So, and the panchakosa itself. And uh, to heal that panchakosa, sometimes we practice asanas, pranayama, meditations for manamaya kosa, vijnanamaya kosa, chantings, all this, along with some Ayurvedic herbal medications to protect it. To, to make it more pure form, not to go for, uh, if you have a headache, not to go for a paracetamol, rather go for warm water, rest, and do some pranayama in that way. So it, it really protect us. Absolutely, and I'm very pleased that in Thailand and in Eastern, Southeastern Asia, societies are much more connected to their tradition. Right. Uh, sadly, in India, because of India's colonial experience and the fact that Indian elite after independence forced India to go in a certain direction and reject India's own uh, traditional right. knowledge, the challenge is much greater in India for us to be connected back to Ayurveda and yoga and all these practices. Uh, but right. fortunately, a change is taking place right now and we are hoping that uh, 
uh, India will be able to catch up with Thailand. I would imagine that Thailand is ahead of India right now in the way all this is practiced. Yeah, this is the this is the place of uh, holistic wellness in the world, capital right, of right. holistic wellness. So that is why, and it is very true that it is in coming future is that that uh, our our science is actually enlightened the Western uh, scientists. If we look the surgery, uh, it it is described in thousand year back in Sutra Sahinda itself that uh, nasal surgery how it opted in India itself. And rather uh, later, the German scientists developed, and today they take the credibility that they took invented this process of plastic surgery. Absolutely, not only that. When the English came to India, they discovered that India also had inoculation against smallpox. So yeah. there was inoculation smallpox. It used to work very, very effectively. And but I, I am hoping that Aparna ji and Alpana ji will take this message to Delhi and tell them that, look, India needs to uh, give uh, an even more um, central place to Ayurveda and yoga for wellness and uh, medicine. Thank you, sir. Definitely, definitely Dr. Kak. Uh, we have a few more uh, uh, questions coming from people who would like to Ask uh, Mr. Nagraj, uh, yeah. I believe you'd like to ask some question. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, Namaskar, my name is Nagraj Prasad. Uh, I'm based in, in Bangkok. From the IT industry, uh, so the question is perhaps uh, closely knit to the subject that you spoke of. What knowledge I gained in the last 40 minutes, perhaps no book could ever give me. My question is that we talk about artificial intelligence and we always relate it to something which is like a supercomputer or something which is going to be helping science in a big way. My question to you, sir, is that is there any application that we see where technology like this touches the common man and makes a difference in, let's say, healthcare or education, uh, which can directly touch them and make a difference? Well, uh... Depends, you know, it depends upon what particular aspect of uh, uh, of one's life you are considering. Clearly, uh, the apps that have emerged in the last 15, 20 years have changed the common man as well. You know, you go to any place in India, you have um, Uber and other uh, ride sharing services and people are connected in a large way um, to everybody else. And the more connection is, you know, the more exchanges, just as there is more exchange of tokens, that means more money. There is more exchange of information and relationships. There is more power, uh, which can have all kinds of uh, impact on society. But I think eventually there is something counterintuitive about all of this technology. And what that is, that all this technology would have become successful if it makes people get in touch with their own selves. You know, that's counterintuitive, that we are going more and more out, but ultimately the end of this journey is to come back to our own self, to be more in touch with yourself so that you have more capacities that you can use to deal with uh, life in all its different forms. So I think that's going to be the next challenge all over the world. And how technology implements that, how IT industry uh, does that, is where more opportunities would be present for investors to make more money. You know, right now, for example, if you look at IT plus wellness, you have all these apps uh, that that check your blood pressure or tell you how much you have walked and this and that, but something more which connects you to yourself. Because you know what has happened is that human beings are fashioning themselves more and more in the image of machines. The next revolutionary step would be not only machines becoming more like humans, but humans becoming more like humans. Right? Because right now they are becoming more like machines. Because uh, a lot of humans uh, run their lives in the image of what they think they should be doing, not doing what they really in their heart want to do. So this is a uh, challenge that exists. 
Thank you very much. I have uh, a friend who wants to ask a question. Abhijit, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, very good afternoon, uh, Swadiha. Uh, 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 I have a question. Uh, I was listening to this uh, and uh, have a question specific to uh, Subhash sir. Uh, sir, uh, you spoken about you know logical science that we used to know in uh, you know Western culture, which is uh, a logical way of zero and one, which is bits. And in Ayurveda, you said three-way logic of uh, you know of science. I wanted to ask a new perspective that a lot of news we are right now hearing about uh, quantum computers about quantum entanglement, quantum uh, superposition, and this new technology is coming in. How this is going to impact the AI industry as such and the AI thought process as such, because the, I think the concept and logic will be in a different way and it will give a new pace to this uh, you know, all AI thought process. Uh, if you can you know, give us a direction how this will impact AI. Abhijit ji, uh, uh, good question because uh, everybody's talking about quantum computers. There's a lot of investment being made by China, by Europe, by US, and even India has made investment in uh, the future of technology in uh, quantum, using quantum computers and uh, all of the, that uh, could emerge out of it. I personally work on quantum computers. In, in fact, if you Google, you'll find that I've written a lot of stuff on it, uh, scientific papers. But let me also tell you, I personally think that quantum computers will never be implemented. So I am very pessimistic about the future. And the reason, now you might ask why. The reason is that in a quantum computer, you are dealing with, of course, what is called qubits, which are like zero and one, but it also has phases which are continuous. So a quantum computer eventually is like an analog computer. And you, and you have the problem of noise. If you have noise, you cannot get rid of it. Because what happens in a quantum computer is that it works uh, in a deterministic way until such time that you interact with it. And the moment you interact with a quantum state, it collapses. So noise in a quantum computer will uh, alter its computation process in a fundamental way, and you cannot eliminate it. So my personal take is that although people are hoping that quantum computers will be built, but they will never be built. Now, you, if you ask me why is so much of money being spent? Well, for two reasons. First of all, um, people want to hedge their bets, and they are afraid. You know, in China, they're afraid, well, what if Americans do it? In America, they are afraid, what if Chinese do it? So they're putting money in it. And then, of course, you have scientists, they want more money. So they're saying, hey, give us some more money. Let's see where it all goes. So it's, it's like that. It's almost like fusion in uh, nuclear physics, which people have been working on for, for 70 or 80 years. And right from 1950s, scientists have been telling funders that, hey, give us some more money, another few billion dollars. And it's going to be there in 10 years and 10 years. And it's we are still not close to it. I think it's going to be the same thing in quantum computing. Thank you so much. Professor Gak, um, I'm just going to, you know, slide in here and pressure you slightly. OK, so we've been talking about like how applications of AI has been used in the right way and in the wrong way. So let me take an example of a model, right? And, and the same, the exact same model is being used to uh, apply and help us with healthcare. And that very same model is being used for facial recognition. Now, we we want to draw a line, and I'm going to ask you where we can draw the line here. So we have on one side of the extreme where we have a linguistic model like GPT-3, you know, which is currently um, coming into the scene, writing novels, writing a blog, writing the actual blog with it, which uh, the GPT-3 model wrote, actually skyrocketed in terms of the, the actual reads, right, the number of readers. But people came to know later that, you know, this was not actually written by a human. It was written by AI. So that's on one side. And on the other side, we have big names like IBM. We have big names like AWS, where they say they are now withdrawing um, further researchers in facial recognition. And we have a lot of people who are withdrawing their researchers in object detection. So where should we draw the line? Well, uh, I think 
you don't draw a line accepting in relation to specific applications and there are lots of pressures of different kind, political, for example, facial recognition. Uh, the, one of the pressures is that it could ensnare people of the wrong color or wrong background, so let's get rid of it altogether. But those are um, reactions in the short term. In the long term, I, I suppose all this will continue. Uh, recognition or pattern classification will be used again and again or increasingly in different apps. Now, with, this, with regard to GPT-3 and all that stuff, uh, there is also stories, for example, there was one in Technology Review, which is published by MIT, by two people just last week, who argued that it didn't make any sense. You know, you have this poetry or this or that. If you really think about it, it doesn't make sense. And right now, it, there's a novelty value. It still is valuable because uh, it could form the initial draft of, a, of some narrative which a person could then much more quickly put together and give it a finishing form. So I think even all of these technologies, including GPT-3, would have applications, but it would be limited. It's like, you know, ultimately, no matter what you do, in fact, all the cognitive tasks we do, they appear mechanical in retrospect, but there's always a spark which comes from somewhere which we cannot put our finger on. You know, it's like, where does creativity emerge from? It always ultimately, perhaps, or one could say perhaps, emerges from outside the box. It's not always from inside the box, because if it's inside the box, you can mechanize it, right? But even whatever decisions there are, which are called creative, even decisions such as, hey, should we change the design of the pajamas or the shirt? And there is a fashion designer who comes along and he, he travels against the current, right? And he does something which nobody else had thought of. And that becomes the new idea. And, and therefore, this will always be an ongoing uh, um, process where some people would say, well, uh, we can allow technology to push further but then somebody would come along and break the rules. In fact, that happens even in the arts. You know, when you go and, um, and learn under a teacher, a guru, let's say music or whatever else, or painting, and you learn whatever has had to be taught as well as can be taught, and then you graduate. But ultimately, in order to be a successful artist, you have to break some of those rules that have been taught. Because otherwise, you'd only be making copies of what your guru had taught you. And that breaking of rules is what lies beyond AI, right? And which is where the human element comes in. That's, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense because, I mean, I think that article which you were talking about in the MIT Technology Review actually pointed out that GPT-3 in the very initial phase uh, thought that grape juice was poison. And what they wrote was that after drinking grape juice, you know, that person passed away. So that's right, really right. interesting. Thanks for your answer. I have a question from Facebook. Uh, that, uh, there are a lot of questions, but I don't know if we have the time. So let me just ask this because uh, it looks very interesting. I kindly explain the influence of Sri Panini on present day evolution of AIs is what the person's asking. So it's probably about Panini. That, uh, okay, pa Panini was this uh, grammarian who wrote a grammar of Sanskrit about 400 or 500 BCE, which is about 2,500 years ago. And these, uh, this grammar is in terms of rules, algebraic rules and meta rules. A meta rule is a rule about rules. And 2,500 years ago, amazing stuff, and that's how a computer program is written now. You know, a computer program is rules uh, and rules about rules because there are instructions which uh, tell you how certain things have to be done. So now what people are saying, scholars are saying that what Panini did was uh, the pioneering 
conception of a computer program and the whole Panani system can be views, viewed as a pioneering conception of a computer itself because what what a computer does is a computer either processes uh, linguistic information or it processes numerical information right we are more used to numerical information like calculations of numbers etc cetera, etc cetera. but a computer is also a machine which processes linguistic information like our brains do our brains are also a computer so what panani did by his grammar which completely described all of sanskrit he created a computer which could process compute uh, which could process sanskrit as a language and therefore according to scholars panani is probably the greatest genius who has ever lived because he did it so long ago and nobody since panani has been able to create something similar for any other language so a truly remarkable contribution everybody in the world should know the name of panini now panini is also a uh, italian word for bread and more people know of the word panini as a bread which you can order in a in a restaurant but truly panini as the greatest genius who created uh, the grammar of sanskrit in 4000 rules is an amazing uh, human achievement. I think we have had such an amazing session. It's been more of an experience, so to speak. It's not been a talk or a presentation or a panel discussion. It's been an experience. We're going to cherish this uh, for a long time. Um, I think just to, I don't think I'll be able to summarize such a, um, you know, um, such a deep topic, but let me just say that uh, the challenge today is that technology is making humans more robotic and there's a discussion of robots or artificial intelligence gaining an upper hand or human intelligence. So I think uh, today scientists and researchers should be thinking about AI or even modern science in the context of non-Western traditions, that is Eastern traditions. I believe Indian or Eastern traditions of science have a lot of lot to offer in breaking new grounds in many fields of modern science, including artificial intelligence. Um, we, are, we are so honored that we had you at this uh, event, Dr. Kak. Thank you so much. And thank you to the other panelists who joined us, uh, Dr. Adrish and uh, Mr. Shivek. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aparnati. Really enjoyed being a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody. Dr. Kak. अपन्ना जी अल्पना मैडम नागराज जी धन्यवाद